Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to be setting up the basic scaffolding for the command line application. That means modifying our index file so that when the entire application starts up, so does the specific command line component. And then building a command line library with some standard functions that we will need to be able to read in inputs from the command line and write them back out so that the user can see them. Let's start with our index.js file. At the top, we are going to need to reference a new library that we haven't quite built yet. And that is going to be called CLI, and it will live in the lib directory. So we're going to save our CLI equals require dot slash lib slash CLI. Now we need to actually start up the application. So we want to start the CLI, but we want to make sure it starts last. That is because the CLI will not just start itself up, but it will hang the console at an input symbol. And so we want all that logging that we do at the beginning, such as the server has started up, the workers has started up, we want all that to happen first. And then we want the CLI to start up so that it can end the console with an input symbol without it being confusing to anyone who's looking at the console. Because if you had an input symbol and then a bunch of output written after it, a user would be unsure whether or not they would be actually seeing a prompt that they could respond to. So we want to start this with a set timeout. And of course, a set timeout isn't the most deterministic way to start something up late, but it'll do for now. So we just want to offset this by 50 milliseconds. And then just like we called server in it, workers in it, we want to call CLI dot in it. That's all the modification we need to do the index file. Now we can create this lib.clf file by doing touch lib slash CLI dot JS. I'm going to open up this file. We can fill it out. At the top, I'm going to just add a comment that these are CLI related tasks. We are going to have a number of dependencies here. And these are the dependencies that we're going to need in order to interact with the console, both reading input and writing output. I'll go into all of these in more detail as we start building out these different features in this CLI library. But for now, let's just require what we need. We're going to need readline, which is var readline equals require readline. Readline is exactly what it sounds like. It's a built-in package to know that lets you read a line. Next, we're going to use util, which we've done before. And this is just a way to get us to be able to set up the CLI specific logging on this next line with the debug convention that we set up before. So we're going to say that var debug equals util dot debug log. But the special phrase for this debugging is going to be CLI. So the logging that we're doing in this file will only be apparent to the user if they start the app with node underscore debug equals CLI and then node index.js. Next, we want to include the events library. As I mentioned, we're going to be building this in a different kind of way. When input comes into the console and we read it in, that's going to emit events that our handlers can respond to. And so we're going to use the events library pretty extensively. So we're going to require events. In order to use the events, we actually have to extend our own class from the base class and then instantiate it. We want to say that class underscore events extends events. Now that we have our own extended class, we want to say var e equals new underscore events. And that is this a convention that Node.js recommends for interacting with the events class. It's specific to the way that this module works. And once you have this new E instantiated, you can do all of the event handling that you will want to do. So let's just instantiate the CLI module object, which is a really fancy way of saying, let's create an object and call it CLI and then let's export it down at the bottom. Module.exports equals CLI. All right, now we need to write this library. Where should we start? Well, in index.js, we're calling CLI.init, so we might as well start there. 
let's define an init script. Say that cli.init equals a function. And what do we want to do within this initialization? We want to send the start message to the console in dark blue this time. So let's go ahead and copy our start message that we used for the server when we said the server is up and running. But instead, we are going to say the CLI is running, and we're going to get rid of the rest of this text. We do want to modify the color though, so rather than using 36, which we were using before, we're going to change this to 34, and that's going to give us a dark blue color. Now that we've said the command line app is running, we actually have to start that prompt that I mentioned earlier. We have to put a input symbol in the console, and this will indicate to the user that we're waiting for something from you. So let's start the interface. The way you do this is define an interface object, and then you use the read line package dot create interface. This takes a bunch of keys, which you can define. So we want to define input as something that should be coming from process dot standard in which in this kind of application would route to the console naturally. Output should route to process standard out, which also will write to the console. And lastly, we want to define what our prompt should look like. For us, we don't need to do anything fancy, so we're just going to leave the prompt as a blank line, as an empty string. So when users see that there's an empty string, that means they're being prompted for something. Now I should mention that the way that we're creating this interface using readline is only one of a few ways that you can create these kind of applications in Node. There's also a REPL module, R-E-P-L, that provides a bunch of the scaffolding that we're about to set up out of the box. The REPL is so easy to use though that I didn't feel it was worth building this section of the course around REPL. I wanted to do a deeper dive in some of these more advanced modules, but later on at the end of this course, I'll go over how to use the REPL module if you'd rather use that. But for now, we are using readline to read one line at a time and write into the console manually rather than using a REPL module which handles all that for you. So we have created the interface. So now when the CLI starts up, users will see this console message and then be met with this prompt. But starting the interface isn't actually enough to read in anything from the user. So now we actually need to create the prompt, not define the prompt symbol as we did above, but actually manually create the prompt that the user will see. So we want to create an initial prompt. So we are going to call underscore interface dot prompt. Now, if I want to start this application up, you can see we are getting the CLI is running, sent back to us, and the user is met with a prompt where they can write something. But when they enter it, nothing happens because we haven't defined any way to handle what they're writing. If I kill this application and then change the prompt to a greater than sign, start it back up, you'll see that we're met with a prompt, but this time it starts with the greater than sign where we can write whatever we want. It's up to you if you want to use a prompt symbol or not. I tend not to use it. So now we have actually created the prompt. We need to start handling the lines of text that the user will write in response to the prompt. So we want to handle each line of input separately. So we're going to call interface and then we're going to bind to the on line event. This is going to be emitted every time the user writes something, presses return, and sends us a line that they just wrote. So on line, this function is going to get called and it's going to pass us this string. So we're going to need to now do something with this string. So we're going to send to the input processor. The input processor isn't something we've defined yet, but we will create that function next. This is going to call cli.processInput, 
and then pass the string that we just got. Now that we have handled this input line from the user, we actually need to reinitialize the prompt. Otherwise, they're not going to see the prompt again. So we need to reinitialize the prompt afterwards. So interface, again, dot prompt. Otherwise, they would just see the prompt the first time, but after they wrote something, they wouldn't see it again. Lastly, we need to handle the situation if the user stops the CLI. So we want to say that in that case, we want to kill the associated process. So interface on close. So on the event where the CLI is closed by the user, we want to call this anonymous function and just manually kill everything with process.exit. This zero is the status code that we're exiting on. If we wanted to exit on a non-zero status code, we could put that there, but zero status code tends to mean that everything is fine, so we want to do that. Now we've set up this input prompt, we need to define this cli.processInput function that will actually handle everything that the user might be writing. So above the initialization script, let's write this input processor. It'll be cli.processInput. It's going to be a function that, as we saw, just takes a string. The first thing we need to do, of course, is sanitize this string. So string equals type of string equals string. And it has a length even after it's trimmed. If so, we want to use it or call it false. Now we only want to process the input if the user actually wrote something. Otherwise, we want to ignore it. So if there's a string, we want to continue. And we don't need an else here because we don't need to handle the case that the user wrote nothing and just pressed return. or had an empty space and pressed return. When that happens, we will naturally, after processing this input, return them to the interface prompt. And so we don't need to actually handle that event. We can just ignore it. So we'll only continue inside of this if, and outside of this if, nothing will happen. Now we want to codify the unique strings that identify the different unique questions that the user can ask. So codify the unique. What that means is we want to respond to a set of strings, as we talked about in the section overview, such as man, help, exit, stats, etc. We want to define what those allowable inputs are so that we can check this string against those strings that we want to allow. And if we don't find a match, we want to just tell the user, sorry, we don't know what you're asking us. So we want to say that var unique inputs is an array, and these are going to be unique strings that could not possibly be confused with each other. Man, help, exit, stats, list users, more user info, list checks, more check info, list logs, more log info. So now that we have these unique strings, we want to try to find a match for the string that the user just sent us. So we're going to go through the possible inputs and emit an event when a match is found. So we're going to start with match found equals false and our counter equals zero. Now we're going to cycle through this array using unique inputs dot sum. But we're going to cycle through and get one input at a time. We want to say if the string to lowercase, so if the lowercase version of the string 
index of this specific input is greater than negative one. In other words, when you take the string that the user gave us and you push it down to lowercase, does this particular input that we are looking at, or this input that we're looking at, or this input that we're looking at, contained within this string? If so, we've uniquely identified which question the user is asking. So in that case, we want to say match found equals true. And then we want to emit an event matching the unique input and include the full string given by the user. So we want to do e.emit. Remember, e is our instantiation of this events class that we extended from the other events module. So we want to emit an event whose name is input. And remember, input is going to be one of these things. So that event name will be man or help or exit, etc. And then we also want to include the string that we received from the user. So anyone binding to this event can bind to stats, for example, and then they will see this string being passed to them when they bind to that class. And that'll make more sense in a few moments. Since we found a match, we want to return true, break out of this loop at whatever place we're in. Now, if we reach all the way to the end of the loop, and if no match is found, tell the user to try again. So if no match found, we're just going to write back to the console, sorry, try again. So we can go ahead and start this application up and see how that works. You can see the CLI is running. If I type in something like foobar, which isn't recognized, it'll say sorry, try again where if I type in man, which is recognized, we won't get a response at all. If I type in help, also recognized, we won't get a response. If I type in fizz, we'll say sorry, try again. So that is the basic scaffolding of a command line application. In the future lectures, we'll obviously need to bind to these different events that could be emitted here so that we can handle them and actually list the users if the user is asking that question, or give a help screen if the user is asking for help, etc. So in the following lectures, we will do just that. We will build out the responses to each of these questions one at a time. But first, we'll need to go through one more lecture that builds a bit of more scaffolding around handling these events. So we'll build some event handling infrastructure, and then we'll build out each response to each of these commands one at a time. So now we can move on to the next lesson.